Hello, I'm Grady, and this is my column on computing. Anarchy and order. The worst thing in this world, next to anarchy, is government, said Harry Beecher Ward. So, what are we to think of a government that listens in on every available form of electrical communication? How do we attend to a president who not only encourages such surveillance, but also uses information gathered therein to direct the actions of his military commanders, even on sovereign soil? Is it acceptable to a free people to permit these actions in the absence of any oversights or checks and balances? Oh, I assume by now you know of whom I'm speaking. President Abraham Lincoln, of course. It's rather an open secret that Lincoln was an avid fan of the telegraph. He was an intelligent, savvy politician who used whatever technology was at his disposal to further his policies. In his time, the telegraph was truly coming into its own, a story detailed in Tom Standage's The Victorian Internet, not just as a means of coordinating train operations, but also as an instrument of business and a predecessor of modern social networking. In every industrialized age, governments have used technology to monitor their borders and economic interests, communicate and shape opinion, tax their citizens, and monitor those citizens' activities. Lincoln was therefore no exception to observation. He was simply using the technology at hand and to good effect. Thomas Jefferson asserted, the purpose of government is to enable the people of a nation to live in safety and happiness. This is a reasonable philosophy. Throughout history, many experiments in government have come and gone, but for the most part, people form governments to attend to the needs that they can't meet individually or even in small groups. What these specific needs are is still fiercely debated by powerful men and women in sequestered rooms and in the virtual halls of Twitter and Facebook, too. But, in general, we see governments attend to defense, establishing and safeguarding the rule of law, carrying out national policies as they relate to other sovereign nations, and advancing the concerns of commerce, education, transportation, health, housing, education, energy, agriculture, and other realms. In Lincoln's time, the telegraph was a form of electrical communication that was on the cusp of changing everything. In our time, so it is with computing, and therefore lies a question we must ponder. How should governments balance computing in the care of human life and happiness against the tyranny and subterfuge that this same technology makes possible? The telegraph was just the beginning. Computing has now utterly changed the balance that this question examines. At one time, communication traveled at the speed of a horse. Now, almost every war or international interaction, no matter how distant, is broadcast in real time. At one time, governments acted on information, limited by the ability of human processes to gather it. Now, we govern on the basis of an embarrassment of digital riches, whose collection and visibility aren't necessarily transparent. At one time, the speed and reach of political and military action was constrained by the movement of matter. Now, we can observe other human, or kill another human, literally half the world away. Why should this even be an issue worthy of mention here in IEEE software? Simply put, we are the ones who are making computing manifest, and there's no little degree of responsibility we must take in its making. Lest I be taken as a crusty curmudgeon, I might well be that, but that's beside the point, let's look at how computing has contributed to our safety and happiness. The weather and the climate is an obvious element of the physical world that impacts our individual lives, the conduct of business, and the needs of a nation and the world. Individually, I might stick my head out the window to make some decisions about how my day will unfold, but certainly there's value to me and everyone else to have more accurate, further-reaching forecasts. This is precisely what NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, does in the U.S. with its weather and climate forecasting models. 
The telegraph changed the nature of weather forecasting when, for the first time, weather observations could be made across the globe, permitting the advance of synoptic meteorology. By the early 1900s, Lewis Richardson in the UK and Wilhelm Bergenis in Norway suggested numerical processes. However, these required tens of thousands of computational resources in an age in which computer meant a person who computes. As electronic computing emerged as one of the consequences of World War II, John von Neumann, along with Jewel Charney at the Institute for Advanced Study, pioneered the first models of practical, computable statistical algorithms for weather prediction. Today, as that field has evolved, we have NOAA's High Resolution Rapid Refresh Program, which offers hourly atmospheric models with a 3-kilometer resolution. This is a governmental use of computing that I think we can all reasonably say is a good use of resources. No individual or even a company could fairly and efficiently develop such a complete system, and such a predictive model's value for a nation is undeniably large. Such resources don't come inexpensively and thus represent a cost to government that must be weighed against the other needs of government. It's also the case that, just as with government investments in physical infrastructure such as roads, legacy software and hardware systems for such an operation as NOAA require ongoing intentional investment. A consequence of the explosion of the potential of computing for government has been the advent of open, transparent data sets. This is what the U.S. data.gov site is all about, but it's not just a U.S. phenomenon. Kenya's open data initiative is similar, and almost every industrialized country has an analog. Using open data sets, it's not hard for me to correlate data, such as, for example, the location and routing of the nation's electrical get grid. There are certainly sound uses for such information. If I'm a business that has significant energy needs, this will help my planning. However, if my uses are more nefarious, that same data might be used for darker concerns. For example, if I were evil, I might well be that, but that's also beside the point, I might use this same information to plot a terrorist attack on a city or region. There will always be a need to balance safety and transparency, privacy and security. So it always has been, but computing amplifies the conversation. Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution empowers Congress to carry out a census every decade. Title 13 of the U.S. Code dictates that data obtained from the census are protected under U.S. privacy laws and are to be kept private for 72 years. The 1890 census was the first to use Herman Hollerith's tabulating, tabulating machines, an effort that compressed the time needed to assemble the young nation's census from eight years to just six weeks and, in the process, contributed to the birth of IBM and the advance of business computing. In 1942, as the U.S. entered World War II, the government placed all persons of Japanese ancestry, even if they were citizens, in internment camps. How did it find such citizens? Despite the laws requiring census data be kept private, census information was key. There will always be a need to balance safety and transparency, privacy and security, and in this case, we can see how in times of war we're often driven by our emotions to disrupt that balance. As Bruce Schneider observed, privacy is an inherent human right and a requirement for maintaining the human condition with dignity and respect. Privacy protects us from abuses by those in power, even if we're doing nothing wrong at the time of the surveillance. Computing has indeed changed the balance of and conversation about privacy and security. Let us presume that organizations such as the U.S. National Security Agency have been and will continue to be able to monitor every form of electronic communication. This is, on the one hand, an interesting problem of computer science, and thus for good reason why some of computing's best and brightest are either in the employ of such organizations or, on the other side, striving to achieve a technological rebalance. On the other hand, this is a difficult problem of government. Computing amplifies the actions of governments, but can also temper their behavior by enabling mechanisms for private communication as well as for open and transparent communication by people of a nation. Similarly, governments can help focus the artifacts of computing to the health and happiness of its citizens and temper it as well. Not all things that are technically possible are necessarily desirable. Yeah.